Greetings everyone and uh, welcome to our uh, number three in the viewing, a uh, higher calling. In this series we are looking at uh, uh, the call that the Lord has given unto us and uh, what are the things that um, we have to learn to fulfill this higher calling that um, the Lord uh, has uh, given unto us. And, uh, Today we are in number three of our viewing and uh, we are looking at um, uh, the presentation uh, teach us how to pray, teach us how to pray. It, it, it is one of the most wonderful things the disciples of Jesus Christ came unto Jesus and told him teach us how to pray how, uh, how, how John uh, taught his disciples as John taught his disciples to pray. And so, as we look into this, let us begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for thy grace and we thank you for thy love. As we go through this, we pray that you may be with us, you may instruct us in this. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Lord, uh, teach us how to pray. This is the most wonderful thing. Uh, We should always be seeking the Lord wherever we are. We should always be seeking the Lord wherever we are. And uh, the, when, when we seek the Lord in prayer, He will reveal unto us uh, one of the Things that we have to walk in in uh, in our lives, and so the higher calling that uh, God God has called us to a noble duty to proclaim the three angels' message, and uh, we cannot proclaim the three angels message unless we are endowed uh, with with the power from above and so how do we get endowed with the powers from above how do we get endowed with the Power from above. This is the most important topic that we are looking uh, as teach us how to pray is the topic of the hour. If we will want power to accomplish the work that we have been given, the only the power is gained in prayer the power is gained in prayer and that's why the disciples asked the lord to teach them how to pray the disciples asked jesus to teach them how to pray it is the only way of having the the power and so Jesus takes them to the book of Matthew chapter 6. When Jesus was upon the earth, he taught his disciples how to pray. He directed them to present their daily needs before God and to cast all their care upon him. And he, and the assurance he gave them that their petition should be heard is assurance also unto us. This is the only way we can have power in our lives to accomplish much that we have to accomplish if we are in Christ, if we are uh, intertwined in his will. No man can be able to spread the three angels' messages if uh, he doesn't have the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. And that is why the disciples asked the Jesus Christ to, uh, to teach them how to pray and when we pray uh 
we are recognizing him as our only God and our mediator, the Lord of our salvation. We cast out all our we, we, we cast out all our idols and uh, be at his tender care. Accept him as the one who is for our interest. And so in Matthew chapter 6 verse 9, after this manner therefore uh, pray ye. After this manner therefore, Matthew chapter 6 verse 9, he tells them how to pray. And uh, I'll do a lot of PowerPoints and uh, I hope you bear with me. He says, The Lord's Prayer was twice given by our Savior, first to the multitude in the Sermon on the Mount, and again some months later to the disciples alone. The disciple had come to connect his hours of prayer with the power of his words and works. Now, as they listened to his supplication, their hearts were awed and humble. As he ceased praying, it was with a conviction of their own deep need that they exclaimed, Lord, teach us to, uh, to pray. And so, look at the underline. They realized that uh, the power of doing miracles and the power of doing what he was doing, the power of his works were contained in his words. And it was after he had uh, connected himself with God in prayer that he had this power to do what actually he did. Luke chapter 11 verse 2 says, When you pray, say, Our Father. And this is important, our Father. When we say our Father, Jesus teaches us to call his Father our Father. He is not ashamed to call us brethren, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11. So ready, so eager is the Savior's heart to welcome us as members of his family, uh, of the family of God, that in the very first words we are to use in approaching God, he places the assurance of our divine relationship, our Father. He is our Father. He told uh, Thomas that I go to my father and your father, I go to my God and your God. And so in our prayer, we are first pointed to our father. The one and the father is somebody who is interested in the affairs of his children. He has not just brought them on earth to leave them to uh, to their own uh, uh, to, to, to their own way. He, he encourages them, he, uh, he shows them the way. And so we realize that he is our father. The father of our Lord Jesus Christ is also our father. And so everything, we are assured that uh, everything we ask of him, he will be able to give unto us. Here is the announcement of that wonderful truth, so full of encouragement and comfort that God loves us as he loves his son. This is what Jesus said in his prayer, in his last prayer for his disciples. Thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. In John 17, 23. The very first, first step in approaching God is to know and believe the love that he has to us. First John 4, 16. For it is through the drawing of his love that we are led to come to him. God loves us as he loves his only son. The perception of God's love works the renunciation of selfishness. In calling God our Father, we recognize all his children as our brethren. We are all a part of the great web of humanity, all members of uh, one family. In our petition, we are to include our neighbors as well as ourselves. No one prays a right who seeks a blessing for himself alone. So when we realize, when we recognize him as our father, in calling God our father, we recognize all his children as our brethren. We, we will not have these variances that we have if we realize and recognize God as our father. Because if we do this, the other brethren who is who are calling him Father, we will uh, uh, recognize them as also uh, our brethren. And that is why we call God our Father. But if you call God your Father, you acknowledge yourself, his children, to be guided by his wisdom and to be obedient in all things. Knowing that his love is changeless, you will accept his plan for your life. As children of God, you will hold his honor, his character, his family, his work as the objects of your highest interest. It will be your joy to recognize and honor your relation to your father and to every member of his family. You will rejoice to do any act, however humble, that will tend to his glory or to the well-being of your kingdom. So it's not just saying our father which is in heaven. There are so many things intertwined 
uh, in calling God uh, our Father. And he says, verse Matthew 6, 9, which art in heaven, our Father which art in heaven. This actually does away with this idea of pantheism, God being everywhere in everything. And this is something that has to be studied so deeply when we say which art in heaven. But I'll not go in the issue of um, God and pantheism and the whole story of Kellogg and the living temple that God is in everything and everywhere. God is in a, 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 a literal place in heaven on his throne. But let us look at this, which art in heaven. He to whom Christ bids us look as our Father is in the heavens, he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. In his care we must safely rest, saying, What time I am afraid I will trust in thee. Psalms 1, 15 verses 3 and Psalms 56 verses 3. Uh, through his omnipresent spirit, he watches at our affairs. He is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. And this is reverencing his name. Let us look at the few things that are contained in hallowing the name of the Lord. To hallow the name of the Lord requires that the words in which we speak of the supreme being be uttered with reverend. Holy and reverend is his name. Psalms 119 verse 9. We are never in any manner to treat lightly the titles or appellations of the deity. In prayer, we enter the audience chamber of the Most High, and we should come before him with holy awe. This is thoughts are from the Mount of Blessing, page 106. And so, the use of his names should be in a reverence manner in our prayers. We are told of his titles like Jehovah, the Almighty, the Mighty. These are not appellations just to be used anyhow in prayer, but they should be used in, in awe and Reverend, but to hallow the name of the Lord means much more than this. We may, like the Jewish in Christ's day, manifest the greatest outward reverence for God and yet profane his name uh, continually. The name of the Lord is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Exodus 34 verses 5 to 7. Of the church of Christ it is written, This is the name wherewith we shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 33 verse 16, this name is put upon every follower of Christ. It is the heritage of the child of God. The family are called after the father. The prophet Jeremiah in the time of Israel saw distress and tribulation prayed, we are called by thy name, leave us known. And so the name of the Lord should be reverenced. The name of the Lord should be hallowed. The name of the Lord when it is mentioned, it is in accordance to his will and not in vanity. And uh, we should be avoiding things like uh, uh, appellations uh, like uh, JC, uh, like oh gosh, such a things are actually the appellations of the name of God and they should be avoided. We actually do a reproach to the name of the Lord. God sends you into the world as his representative. In every act of life you are to make manifest the name of God. This petition calls upon you to possess his character. You cannot hallow his name, you cannot represent him to the world unless in life and character you represent the very life and character of God. Thy kingdom come. When we pray thy kingdom come, what are we actually talking about? God is our father who loves us and cares for us as his children. He is also the great king of the universe. The interests of his kingdom are our interests and we are to work for it is a building. When we say the kingdom come, we are in thoughts of from the Mount of Blessings. This is what we are looking at, page 107. The kingdom come. We, we are not just to wait for it, but to work for it. The kingdom of God's grace is now being established as day by day hearts that have been full of sin and rebellion yield to the sovereignty of his love. But the full establishment of the kingdom of his glory will not take place until the second coming of Christ to this world. The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is to be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Daniel 7, 27. They shall inherit the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. But uh, for his literal kingdom, for his um, kingdom of glory to be established literally, he has to come in our hearts and reign. The kingdom of God must be in our hearts. We shouldn't be looking it anywhere. Yes. It will come and the saints shall possess it. But for them to come and possess it, they have to have Christ abiding in the heart. 
the kingdom must be established in their hearts first before they be established in that land literally but before the coming that coming jesus said the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations matthew 24 14 his kingdom will not come until the good tidings of his grace have been carried to all the earth hence as we give ourselves to god and win others souls to him we hasten the coming of his kingdom only those who devote themselves to his service saying here i am send me at the one that are actually establishing his kingdom it's not to be waited in idleness but in watchfulness the watchmen on zion's wall have to sound a certain trumpet with a certain note their life have to show that actually they are waiting for that kingdom their manner of prayer their manner of doing things have to show that actually they are waiting for that kingdom they have not to wait for it in idleness from darkness to light and from the power of satan to god that they may receive forgiveness of sin and heart and among them which are sanctified they alone pray in sincerity their their kingdom come and this was a continuation here those who say here am i send me Isaiah 6, 8, from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance which them which are sanctified. They alone pray in sincerity, thy kingdom come. So those who are accepting Christ to sanctify their life and use them for his service are truly the one who are praying thy kingdom come. We are looking at the Lord's Prayer. Teach us how to pray. This is the number three in our higher calling. And the number three we are looking at God or Lord teach us how to pray. And we are looking just simply at the book of Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. In fact, this should be called actually the disciples' prayer. It is the prayer which uh, it is the disciples which are praying, but it's a prayer which is taught by the Lord. The, the Lord's Prayer, I believe it is uh, John chapter 17 where he prays. It is his own prayer. He is praying for his disciples. But Matthew chapter 6, it is disciples now who have to pray this matthew chapter 6 verse 10 they will be done in earth as it is in heaven when we pray they will be done in earth as it is in heaven what actually are, are we talking about the will of god is expressed in the precepts of his law and the principles of his law are the principles of heaven the petition that will be done on earth as it is in heaven is a prayer that the reign of evil on this earth may be ended that sin may be forever destroyed and the kingdom of righteousness be established then his earth as in heaven will be fulfilled all the good pleasure of his goodness. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 11. So when we pray that will be done on earth as it is done in heaven, we are praying that whatever is in heaven may be replicated here on earth. That um, the 144 may under the prayer uh, of the Lord that he will have a people on earth who can exhibit his own righteousness and uh, uh, they will shine the, like the firmaments. Uh, they will shine like the stars uh, uh, here on earth. The earth that is full of evil and many shall come unto the light. You read in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 60, Arise, thy light has come, and the Gentiles shall come unto thy light. So as there is only holiness in heaven, so the children of God here on earth shall show only holiness. This is actually that will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. The first half of the prayer Jesus has taught us in regard to the name and kingdom and the will of God, that his name may be honored, his kingdom established, his will performed. When you have thus made God's service your first interest, you may ask with confidence that your own needs may be supplied. And so... The Lord's Prayer actually is a division of the two tablets uh, of the commandments. That is the supreme love of God and the supreme love of man. The two, the two great commandments are revealed in the Lord's Prayer. First of all, the kingdom of God, the love, the vertical love towards God. And then uh, the next thing you notice in the, 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 the other half of the Lord's Prayer actually is the second commandment which is the love of fellow men and uh, one thing that i didn't say when you look at the lord's prayer it is divested of the word i it is divested of the word i which means that 
And you remember it is I that made Satan to be thrown from heaven to earth. And so while the Lord is teaching his children how to pray, he divests I from the prayer. Does it mean that we don't have to pray for our needs? No, but the supreme thing is the love of God and then the love of fellow neighbors. And that is why the Lord's prayer is full of our, 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 our. Because the Lord will want us to be divested of self. So the first half of the prayer Jesus has taught us is in regard to the name and kingdom of and will of God. That is the supreme love upon God, that his name may be honored, his kingdom established, his will be performed. Love God with all thy heart and with all thine soul. Then he goes to the second half. When you have thus made God's service your first interest, you may ask with confidence that your own needs may be supplied. The second table of the stone. If you have renounced self and given yourself to Christ, you are a member of the family of God and everything in the Father's house is for you. All the treasures of God are open to you, both the world that now is and that which is to come. Give us our daily bread. If you have renounced self and given yourself to Christ, you are a member of the family of God. But ah, but you are as a child who is not yet placed in control of his inheritance. God does not entrust to you your precious possession, lest Satan by his will art should beguile you as he did uh, the first pair in Eden. Christ hold it for you, safe beyond the spoiler's reach. Like the child, you shall receive day by day what is required for the days of need. Every day you are to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Be not dismayed if you have not sufficient for tomorrow. You have the assurance of his promise, so shall thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. David, De David says, I have been young, and now I am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. Now, th there is a point to realize in the Lord's Prayer, in teach us how to pray that daily we have to depend on the Lord. There is no day that we don't have to depend on the Lord. And that's we why we pray, give us this day our daily prayer bread tomorrow has it is sufficient problem we cannot be looking at tomorrow we have to live the day that the lord has given us in its fullness we are to plan for eternity but we are to live as if we are li living this uh, this hour that we are living in and so this helps us to depend on the Lord daily. And this is not just about the daily bread of the physical need, but even the spiritual bread, we have to ask the Lord daily. We have to depend on him. And you'll find that the wise man in Proverbs is saying that, um, Lord, give me that which is sufficient, that I may not cast thy name and deny not me, uh, give me not that which is so much, that, Lord, I may forget about this. So he is praying that which is sufficient for the day. And this is how we should also pray to the Lord. When we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we ask for others as well as ourselves. And we acknowledge that what God gives us is not for ourselves alone. God gives to us in trust that we may feed the hungry. Of his goodness he has prepared for the poor, Psalm 68, verses 10. And uh, in Desire of Ages, page 21, paragraph 2, we find that... Um, Christ received all so that he may give. Also, when we are praying, we are not just praying for selfish ambitions, but we are praying so that we may bless others. He who prays to bless others will have his prayers answered immediately. There are two prayers which the Lord, the Lord will ever answer. Prayer to overcome sin and prayer to bless others. These two prayers... God will always honor them instantly when you ask for it. He will never deny you. So we are looking at number three in the series, Our Higher Calling, and the number three is Lord, teach us how to pray. And we are looking at give us this day our daily bread. The prayer for daily bread includes not only food to sustain the body, but that spiritual bread which will nourish the soul unto life everlasting. Jesus bids us labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. John chapter 6 verse 27. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of the Lord. That is um, Matthew 4, 4 and uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 3. And so we are not just praying for our bellies to be filled with uh, perishing food. 
when you look at uh, is it uh, second corinthians 6 13 or first corinthians 6 13 that food for the belly and the belly for the food but both who shall be destroyed we, we should not just be concerned with the things that perish but we should be concerned with those things that does not uh, uh, perish god will send his spirit to reveal to us the truth which will strengthen our soul for the day's need and In teaching us to ask every day for what we need, both temporal and spiritual blessings, God has a purpose to accomplish for our good. He will have us realize our dependence upon his constant care, for he is seeking to draw us into communion with himself. In this communion with Christ, through prayer and the study of the, of, of the great and precious truth of his word, we shall as hungry souls be fed, as those that thirst we shall be refreshed at the fountain of of life. Our higher calling is to move to where God is. This is what the series is all about. And know our obligations and the purpose and the reason why we were given birth to. It is not just to have the life enjoyment. Yes, that is part of it, but it is to put the sin problem to an end, to bear the image of God. This is the higher calling that we have received from God, to be like him. And we are looking at the steps that will make us respond to this higher calling. And this day we are looking at uh, Lord teach us how to pray. And we are uh, Luke chapter 11 verse 14. Forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Just Jesus teaches that we can receive forgiveness from God only as we forgive others. It is the love of God that draws us unto him, and that love cannot touch our hearts without creating love for our brethren. So there is a prerequisite for the forgiveness of sin. If we don't forgive others, we shall not be forgiven. And as we forgive others, then we are forgiven. A man who will not forgive another person who has wronged them will not also receive forgiveness from the Lord. And this forgiveness is tied with receiving everything that um, we desire. You, when you look at the book of Mark, chapter 11, verses 24, 25, it says that um, whatever you ask, when you go on your knees, believe that you have received and it shall be thine. And if you have anything, what you have to forgive, forgive and it shall be forgiven unto thee. So in requesting, in asking of the Lord the things we need, there is something that is attached to it, forgiveness of others. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And if we don't do that, then we shall not be forgiven and the things which we pray for, we shall not get them. After completing the Lord's prayer, Jesus added, if you forgive men their trespasses, you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. He who is unforgiving cuts off the very channel through which alone he can receive mercy from God. You see that? Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 113. That whoever doesn't forgive cuts off the channel, the very channel through which alone he can receive mercy from God. So there are many people who are struggling with things in life. There are many people who are struggling to get a blessing in their lives. But if you will do a diagnosis of why they are not getting these blessings, it is because they still have grudges with other people. They have this unforgiving heart. They wouldn't come to a place where they will forgive others so as to be forgiven. But forgiveness has a broader meaning than many suppose. When God gives the promise that he will abundantly pardon, he adds as if the meaning of that promise exceeded all that we could comprehend. By thoughts, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, said the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, Isaiah 55, 7-9. And uh, the word forgive is a word that is compounded with two words, for and give. So when we are talking about forgiving sins or forgive sins, it is an exchange for give. So for your iniquity, he gives out something. And uh, for he takes what you have 
which actually is not helping your life and give he gives in something that helps you so when you are talking about forgiving others their debts or their sins or their iniquities uh or their trespasses i i i, I may say so uh you are taking their guilt that they have because they have wronged you understand this well when we are talking about forgiving trespasses others when the lord forgives us he takes the sin away and gives us his spirit in abundance so that we may walk as if we have never seen reinstate us in the position of a holy being that has never seen and he doesn't look at us uh as if with them with them uh what can i say with suspicion when god forgives us our sins he gives us the right to be called his sons he doesn't look at us with suspicion and so when we forgive others their trespasses we take away the guilt they have that we, they have wronged us and restore confidence we give them confidence that they had lost in us we take their guilt and restore the confidence that they didn't have when they trespassed against us and so forgiveness is not just telling somebody okay now i forgive you you did wrong unto me and then you you start looking at this person with suspicion will they actually uh, 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 continue to to do the things that i have told them to do no 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 that is not reinstatement that is not forgiveness looking at your brethren with suspicion is not forgiveness because you have forgiven their trespasses you have to restore the confidence uh, uh, let us say in such a way that uh, somebody has trespassed against thee like uh, i give a child my bike and uh, the child destroys my bike and then the child is so guilty and uh, the child is trembling what will my brother uh do or now how can i even approach him to do ask uh, him of anything there is guilt involved in self but to forgive this person or this child the trespass i have to restore the confidence in him after i have repaired my bike i can still entrust the child with my bike without suspecting that he will destroy this is the restoration this is what we talk about the confidence in forgiveness you can trust the person with the things that they destroyed again and take away their guilt and not look at them with suspicion that is uh, forgiveness and so uh god's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation mount of blessing page 114 it is not only forgiveness for sin but reclaiming from sin it is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart david had the true conception of forgiveness when he prayed create in me a clean heart o god and renew a right spirit within me psalms 51:10 and again he says as far as the east is from the west so far hath he removed our transgression from us psalms 103 uh, verses 12 the one essential for us is the one thing essential for us in order that we may receive and impart the forgiving love of god is to know and believe the love that he has to us 1 john 4:16 when we feel that we have sinned and cannot pray it is then that the time to pray ashamed we may be and deeply humble but we must pray and believe this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom i am chief 1 Timothy 1:15 so we acknowledge our guilt but in acknowledging this guilt we understand that in for give he takes our sin and gives us his pure character his garment of righteousness if we confess our sin god is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness to take away everything that besets us and everything that prevents us from approaching him bring us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil 
one. This is something that has been cavilled upon that uh, God leads us into temptation. But is this really what the verse is talking about? Bring us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let us look at it. Temptation is enticement to sin, and this does not proceed from God, but from Satan, and from the evil of our own hearts. But God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempted no man. James 1, 13. And so when we are praying, bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, what are we actually saying? Every temptation resisted, every betrayal born gives us a new experience and advances us in the work of character building, Mount of Blessing, page 117. The soul that through divine power resists temptation reveals to the world and to the heavenly universe the efficiency of the grace of Christ. So when we are praying that um, lead us not into temptation, what we are actually praying is that Lord shield us from doing our own will, but give us an experience uh, in uh, character building and character formation. This is essential what we are praying for that the Lord may give us a designing spirit that we may not be led to uh, be enticed and espouse the things that belongs to the devil, but we may continue in righteousness. But while we are not to be dismayed by trial, bitter though it be, we should pray that God will not permit us to be brought where we shall be drawn away by the desires of our own evil hearts. In offering the prayer that Christ has given, we surrender ourselves to the guidance of God, asking him to lead us in safe paths. This is the way walking in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, and uh, walking in spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So when we are praying that um, lead us not into temptation, we are praying that the Lord may give us his spirit so that we may not fulfill the desires of our sinful self. The prayer bring us not into temptation, is itself a promise. If we commit ourselves to God, we have the assurance he will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. First Corinthians 10, 13. And so thoughts, of Mount, or, of, thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 118, is teaching us something that um, when we pray, lead us not into temptation, we are actually asking the Lord, not to be tempted above that which we may be able to bear, not to be tested in such a way that we may give up on our faith. Live in conduct with the living Christ and he will hold you firmly by a hand that will never let go. Know and believe that the love that God has to us and you are secure. That love is a fortress impregnable to all the delusions and assaults of Satan. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run into it and is safe. Proverbs 18.10 and uh, uh, the only safety for us, the only way we can meet our higher calling is a continual dependence on, Lord, on, on the Lord. The, there is no way we can achieve the height in which the Lord has called us if we don't hold on to Christ. We don't believe in him. We don't continually depend on him for uh, the successes in our life. Then in kingdom, then is the kingdom and the power and the glory. What does this mean to us? The last, the last, like this first sentence of the Lord's prayer points to our father as above all power and authority and every name that is named. The power and the glory belong unto him whose great purpose will still move on and thwart it toward their consummation. In the prayer that breathes their daily ones, the disciples of Christ were directed to look above all the power and dominion of evil unto the Lord their God, whose kingdom ruleth over all, and who is their Father in everlasting prayer. So the last sentence brings us back to the first sentence. That, and when you look at the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18, he says that all power and authority in heaven on earth has been given unto me. And so when we are praying that thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, we are realizing that all power is invested in Christ. And as it is invested in Christ, he bids us go into the world, teach, baptize, and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded thee, and lo, I am with thee until the end of the age. And so we realize that uh, our power 
doesn't come from us, but the power comes from Christ himself, who has bid us to go. And uh, in Christ object lesson, is it in Christ object lesson or means of healing page uh, 333? I believe it should be in Christ object lesson. Let me just have it if. Yes, in Christ Object Lesson, page 333, paragraph 1, uh, I have it here on the screen. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his biddings are his enablings. Christ Object Lesson, page 333, paragraph 1. And so, when we are recognizing his... A kingdom, his power, and his glory, we are actually admitting that uh, his biddings are his enabling, and if we go in his name, then uh, we shall have all the powers in his kingdom. We are now standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. A crisis is before us as such as the world has never witnessed. And sweetly to us comes the assuring that God's kingdom ruleth over all. The program of coming event is in his hands, our maker. The majesty of heaven has the destiny of all na of nations as well as the concerns of the, his church. In his own charge, the divine instructor is saying to every agent in accomplishing of his plan, as he said to Cyrus, I guarded thee, though thou hast not known me. Isaiah 45 verse 5. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. In thine hand is power and might and in thine hand is to make great and to give strength unto all. First Chronicles 29 verses 11 and 12. And so our higher calling, Lord, teach us how to pray. It calls for us to fully depend on him. It calls for us to acknowledge his sovereignty, his power and his authority, and our relation to God and our fellow men, because the Lord's Prayer is divided into two tables of the stone, the love of God and the love of man. And uh, as we see the things that are happening in the world and the apostasies, and the evils that are happening in the world, the Lord's prayer teaches our fully dependent on the Lord. And so I pray that um, you will be held in this higher calling to reach a mark that um, the Lord has set for us. Our fully dependence is upon him. And uh, i like to read uh, the verse that is guiding us in this series as we close. The book of Philippians chapter 3. As you go to sleep, those people are going in the regions to sleep, those who are in the afternoon, and those in Kenya who are starting their days. As you go about what you are going about, always remember this, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians Chapter 3, verses 12. This is what I'm leaving with you, to guide you, to give you strength, and to enable you continue. This is the title of our series, Our Higher Calling, and we were looking at um, Lord Teachers to Pray. Not as though I had already attained, 312 Philippians, either were already perfect, but I follow after Eve, that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the price of the higher calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is the title of our, uh, of our series, Our Higher Calling. We press forward. And one way of reaching this higher calling, the mark which we have called, we have been called, is prayer. 
and you realize in the first three sessions we were dealing with prayer and today we are dealing with the Lord teach us how to pray. It is only when we are anchored in Christ through prayer, we are told that pray continually, let all your needs be known unto the Lord. It is when we give our hearts to the Lord and we continue in prayer that we will get the strength to reach this higher calling mark. Let us uh, pray as we end. Heavenly Father, we thank you because even in prayer, Jesus, you have taught us how to pray. We are not to pray only, we are not to pray for our own selfish ambitions, but we are to pray how you taught us to pray. And so help us to continue in these things and to realize that uh, you are the one who guides us in everything and who holds the reins of all the kingdoms. Let the kingdom be established in our hearts, in our daily activities that we may lift thy name high, we may decrease as you increase daily. May you guide us in this day and in everything we do, let us do for the glory of the name. For this thing we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.